I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. That, somewhat predictably, is Woody Allen. No one can confidently say that he will still be living tomorrow. Or that's somebody a little bit older than Woody Allen, Euripides. Death may be the greatest of all human blessings. Somebody older still, Socrates, said that. Death ends a life, not a relationship. And that's from uh, sports writer and novelist Mitch Albom in his book Tuesdays with Maury. A man's dying is more the survivor's affair than his own. That was written by the immortal writer Thomas Mann. The goal of all life is death, Sigmund Freud. We're going to be talking today about what is the most sensitive and difficult and scary and fascinating topic in this life, and that's death. And we're going to be talking about it, about the ritual of death and about the process and about the necessity of grieving with veteran funeral director Anthony Guarino. I'm Bruce Apar, and you're watching Hudson Valley WXYZ with Bruce the Blog. Hudson Valley WXYZ with Bruce the Blog is brought to you by Chase Media Group, and we always thank the CEO, Carla Chase, as well as Frank J. Rich for producing the show. And this is a weekly program that brings you very interesting people making unique contributions to our quality of life, and we also like to explore ideas and issues and topics that are important to all of us uh, who live in, in this community. And you could see all of the shows going back several years, actually on YouTube by searching for Hudson Valley WXYZ or searching for Bruce the Blog for that matter. So uh, Anthony Guarino, welcome. Bruce, thank thanks, you. Thanks for being here. Um, so as I was saying at the beginning, and, and there were some interesting quotes uh, about the, the nature of death and you know, sort of insights about death. Um, and well, I mean, you've been doing this a long time, right? 35 Thir years. 35 years, yeah. As a licensed funeral director. Um, and so maybe, you know, the first question that we should talk about uh, is what you know. What is what in your view, in your expert view, uh, and your experience is the reason for funerals? You know, what, like uh, people have funerals to I guess, get through the grieving process. But uh, you know, you were talking to me before about there have been cases where somebody who said to you, you they don't want a funeral, and then when they had it, they were happy. You know, well, they were glad or they were relieved that they yeah. that you convinced them otherwise, right? Yeah. You know, th there is a reason why we have funerals, why funeral service is important to people. It's, a, it's the experience of a loss of a loved one, uh, whether it's a parent or, or, a, um, or a spouse or a child. Um, you need to go through that grieving process. And uh, part of that is, the, is um, people coming to give their condolences, uh, to share that, that uh, experience with the community. To be able to, um, to to receive that help in those first couple of days, to know that people cared, and and came to help, whether uh, you send flowers, whether you send a mass card, uh, whether you send fruit to the house, whether uh, you're just there to to uh, to say I'm sorry, you right. know, I'm sorry for your loss. Right. Um, that's that's helping people get through um, the worst time of their life. Right. And we should establish that. Uh, you uh, own two funeral homes, right? I do. And so why don't you talk about what, what um, those are? I am originally, um, I worked, uh, when I was uh, bef going through school, I worked at a funeral home for my uncle right. in the Bronx and uh, 238th Street in White Plains Road, Woodlawn Morticians. 
Um, but in 1980, uh, my brother purchased a funeral home in Mount Vernon, the Antonio Funeral Home, which I have been at for the last 35 years. Um, so we have, I, I've worked in that community for, for many, many years. Right. And, um, and five years ago, opened up here in, in Yorktown. We, um, interesting story how that happened. Um, for, for many years, the um, people in the Yorktown community that I know, uh, the DeVito family was one, um, who were originally from Mount Vernon. And they built the funeral home that uh, we owned in Mount Vernon, the Antonio Funeral Home. Um, I saw Jack DeVito at a funeral 25, 30 years ago, and he said to me, Yorktown's the place you need to be. Oh. He said, I have the plans for this building. He said that that long ago? That long 25, ago. 25, 30 years ago. Yep. Wow. And, and of course, it, we should mention, just as you're discussing this or explaining this, Anthony, that in Yorktown, there is a, a field named in, in his honor. And, you know, he's a very well-known name in, in yes. Yorktown. And, um, uh, and his sons, you know, are very active, and, and so that's uh, uh, that's an interesting fact. Well, back in the 50s, they were originally a Mount Vernon family. Yeah. That um, that that uh, were very close to the Anantono family years ago, um, and he said to me, "Yorktown's a place you need to be. <laughs> I have the the plans for this building that we had in Mount Vernon," and um, he said, "You should come." And you know, for years I thought about it. Um, Probably about 10, 15 years later, uh, there was a very well-known priest at St. Patrick's Church who was pastor there for many years, who said to me one day, and I knew him very well, he said, Yorktown is the place you need to be. Hmm. So as time passed, um, I was uh, always looking for a place to be here. Um, you need the right location. Right. And um, at, through, through a friend that I went to grammar school with, I met uh, Eric, Eric Di Bartolo, right. and um, two months after I, I met Eric, he, um, he found this location, he asked me what I thought of it, and I said, um, it's, it's just a perfect location. Yeah. It's near the Taconic State Parkway, it right. borders all of the, we're in the north, northern section of uh, Yorktown, and we border Mayapak, we border Putnam Valley and right. Portland Manor. I asked Eric to, um, um, you know, to be a part of this, and he was very happy to do so. And um, it's been five years now, and it's been a very, very good five years. We've we've helped a, a lot of people in the right. short time that we've been in this community. Yeah. And we should mention for a lot of people watching this who are not from Yorktown or that Eric D. Bartolo for a very long time was the uh, highway superintendent. Yes. And did did an extraordinary job. Yes, he did. Um, and now he's the president of the Yorktown Chamber of Commerce and still doing an extraordinary job with yes, that. And yes. so he's, uh, he's extremely prominent and has been for many years in the community. So. And, and in the funeral business, um, he was new to this, right? but he had the right demeanor for it. Yeah. He's, um, he, he's a guy who wants to, uh, to help people. Right. And uh, right. this is a perfect setting for him. So it, it, well. it's, been a, it's been a great uh, partnership. Well, I mean, one of his, I think one of his distinctions as highway superintendent was his customer service. Yes. I mean, he was known for that. Yes. That, uh, you know, if something needed to be done, he was there right, you know, on the spot immediately yep. and helping people. So yep. that's, and, and it, it may sound um, odd to some people, Anthony, when you say location is important for a funeral home, because when somebody is ready to uh, use a funeral home, it's a necessity. I mean, so w why is the location that well, important? Well, you know, um, most of my life, most of my career has been in Lower Westchester, but there has been um, a lot of people have moved up to this area, um, and they have family and friends who, who uh, live in Lower Westchester, uh, or maybe up in Putnam or Orange, or maybe in, in Nyack in, in Rockland County. Right. So when those people are coming to a funeral, um, it's very easy for them to come right off the Taconic State Parkway, Okay. They're, they're off right. at Route 6, two minutes, they're at the funeral home. Right. So it's a good central location, easy to get to, for right. all the right. families and friends who are coming from other areas. Right. And so, so I guess part of that, uh, what you're saying, is that the area was underserved, in a way. Um, this immediate area. This I mean, immediate this, yeah, area. Right. Yeah. It, it, um, the, the population um, ha has over 40,000 people just in Yorktown alone. Right. Uh, and that has grown significantly um, right. in, in the last 20 years. Right. So, yes. um, 
you know, so those people who moved up 30 years ago, um, you know, this is a relatively new community. Right. You yeah. know, for, for most people. And um, with what you do, you know, as I don't have to tell you, there's, you know, been movies and TV shows and things, in some cases where they, you know, are satirical about funeral directors or sort of the butt of jokes or, you know. Yes. And so, you know, as somebody who actually does this for a living, and it's a, obviously a very serious uh, and important and complicated job, mm -hmm. right? Um, based on how people perceive you, you know, what would you say are some of the maybe misconceptions that they don't really understand that you would like to clarify for everybody? Well, you know, we all have lives. I mean, I'm, I'm married. I have two children. Right. Um, I have a grandson, you know. And, a new uh, grandson. A new grandson. Congratulations. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you. My daughter was recently married um, uh, and lives, and both my son and daughter live here in Yorktown. Uh, so my life is really no different than anyone else's. Right. Um, what, what makes my life different, however, is that uh, my work schedule is not the same right. as most people. You know, most people, when I go home at 5 o'clock, their day is over. Right. Uh, mine may not be over. Right. So um, that, that's really what's different. Um, I don't find the, um, I, I try and be as, in the community as much as I can and uh, to, to, for ha to have people know who I am and who my family is. Right. Um, so there, I, I, I don't hear that, those misconceptions. Um, I'm not an unknown entity. Right, no, it's true. You're not. Yeah. yeah so I, right. I yeah. try and, and be out there and as civic minded as I can right. uh, to get involved in the community as much as we can. And and it's very much a family affair, right, with you, uh, with your uh, two children, son and, and daughter. And then you were telling me you have two brothers who are involved in in the same business. Yes. But as far as your immediate family, um, is that usually what happens with people who are in your business, that it gets passed down from one generation to the next? It does. It does. Um, my, my son and daughter are both in a business. Anthony works most of the time down at the funeral home in Mount Vernon, and my daughter works with me here in Yorktown most of the time. Um, she, was, uh, she, she went to Pace University. Right. Uh, she received a degree. She wanted to go for a master's in education. Right. And she spent two months with me in the office, and she said, Dad, can I stay? Because she felt like she was helping people. Right. And it's, um, I always told both of my children, um, you need to be happy in what you do. Right. If you like yeah. what you do, right. you'll, you'll, you'll have a good life. Right. And, and, um, and they both like what they do. Yeah. And, yeah. and you were mentioning, and I think it's very uh, instructive for people to know this, but I think naturally, people would be curious about how does somebody go into this field. So you mentioned, you know, one way which seems to be prevalent is family ties, right? Yes. But then there were other examples uh, that you were relating to me about uh, people who went into it based on their own personal experience with a funeral or uh, a funeral home director, right? Yeah, uh, that's correct. We, um, I, I had a young lady who um, sent me an email and she had just gone to school for funeral directing and she was looking for an apprenticeship. So I called her up and the first thing I always ask people is what made you get into this business? And she said to me, well, I had a death in my family. My father died. And um, I felt I had an experience with a funeral director that really turned my life. And I thought to myself, that's what I want to do. And for this young lady, it was a second career. She worked down in New York City and she wanted to change careers and get into this business because uh, she felt that she can come out and help people. Right. And then interestingly enough, last week I met another young lady who told me that she recently graduated school for funeral directing. And again I asked her, mm -hmm. why did you get into this business? And she said, well, I, I had a bad experience when my, uh, my d her father died when she was 15 years old. I probably think she was probably late 20s, early 30s now. And she said, I wanted to get into this business because I had a bad experience with the funeral director. And I thought to myself, I can do better than him. And I can <laughs> do more for people than he could. Right. No, so and, 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 the, and that's the thing. You know, I know, even if I didn't know what you did, you know, you have a very steady and, you know, pleasing personality. And 
I would think that apart from the training that is required, which from what you were telling me is, I think it's a, m a lot more extensive than people may realize, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in terms of the you know, higher education you go through yes. and, and then internship and other things. But apart from the, the actual training or the knowledge base that you need to have as a funeral director, it seems to me you have to have just a certain inborn personality that you can't teach people. Either you, you know, either you're like that or you're not. And if you're in any way abrasive, <laughs> I don't think that's the right field for you to go. <laughs> which is what sound, maybe sounds like her experience was. Yes. Right. And, I mean, but but do you find that's the case? Like, uh, like with your children and your brother, is that part of it has to be just uh, ingrained in you, right? I mean, uh, it's nothing that you can teach. Right. Um, you know, there we have several employees that work for us. I have a. Um, uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Guido Cicchetti who works in the funeral home in Mount Vernon. Um, born and raised in Mount Vernon. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's, a re he's a good, good funeral director. He's right. got a great disposition. He's very, very good with people. Um, you know, from time to time I always look, you know, for a new licensed person um, to, to uh, help and assist us. Uh, finding that right person sometimes is very difficult right. because it's all about your demeanor. Yep. And it's all about how the community perceives you. Right, about relationships. It's right. all about relationships. Yes. Yes. And, and also, on, uh, something else to, in talking about misconceptions uh, is what a funeral home should look and feel like, right? I mean, there are, there are funeral homes you go into and they're sort of depressing. Yes. <laughs> you know, but in your case, uh, you know, I'm familiar with the, with the Yorktown location. Uh, that's not at all the case, right? I mean, uh, and, and that I imagine was very conscious on your part, that it's very uplifting and, and bright. We, um, w I had the funeral home in Mount Vernon done um, several, years several years before I bought, um, before we opened here in Yorktown. And I had decorators come in and I t explained to them that I wanted them, I wanted the place to feel comfortable. I wanted it to feel like a place where people can come and sit and, um, and, and feel at peace. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of transitioned that up into the Yorktown Funeral Home. We have a, uh, a, a wall with 100 plants in it. Right. It's a tree, it's a plant wall. Um, and when you walk into the funeral home, it's a very, very soothing, uh, it's right. almost like art. Yep. I have a woman who comes in once a week. She she takes care of it, and they're they're always healthy and the plants. spry. The plants, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it's it, it, as soon as you walk in, it's a very calming feeling. And, and it's I mean, and it signifies life, right? And plants. It, yes, right. yes, that's right. That's right. And, and um, one of the things that I, I think people are not necessarily aware of, um, and maybe they don't they don't want to be aware of it until they have to be, but is that you don't have to wait until somebody does pass away um, for whom you're responsible or at least for whose funeral you'd be responsible right to plan ahead that's true and, is, and uh, that, that seems to be a trend or a growing trend it is a business. growing yeah. trend most people many many people do uh, come and pre-plan funerals whether for themselves or for their parents um, no one wants to be put under that stress of, of making decisions at the time when someone passes away. Right. Um, it's so much easier to come and, and talk about it before. So when the time comes, all of the funeral plans are set and everyone knows what needs to be done. Right. And uh, how do you uh, encourage people to do that? I mean, uh, well, you know, we do advertise pre-planning and, and um, we let them know that um, uh, the service is available. We, um, f some people do it for estate reasons. Their attorneys um, recommend that they right. do yeah. pre-planning. Uh, there are irrevocable trusts that we can set up for people right. who, um, who may have to go into a nursing home. So these funds are set aside. You should, you should explain that for people who don't know that kind of legalese, uh, yes. an irrevocable trust. I mean. Yes. Well, there, there, are two, there are two types of um, uh, pre-plan arrangements that people can make, and that's revocable trusts, where money is, if, if they decide they're going to pay, prepay for the funeral, we don't keep the money, but the money goes into a trust account. Right. Uh, and it's set aside with, in, in, with their Social Security number in their name, so it's safe. Right. Uh, it's FDIC insured, so nothing could ever happen to that money. 
in a revocable trust, people can, if they decide they're going to move to California, can right, take that money with them right, and, right. And, and use it anywhere. Uh, with an irrevocable trust, those are generally for people who are going, uh, who are spending down their funds. Perhaps they had to go into a nursing home, right? Um, and, and they're starting to run out of money. They can take the money for the funeral and put it into that irrevocable trust. And what that means is it can only be used for the purpose of the funeral. Oh, okay. It's so, sort of like an escrow fund in a way, right? Well, it's it, a little it's, bit, what, right. what happens is the, the money that's put into that trust, um, if you don't use that money, it goes back to the state. Right. So it, it, um, it, it's a way for people to, to have it paid for, and the burden of that payment is not left to the children. Right. Oh, okay. Um, you know, they say that the two uh, things that people most fear in life are public speaking, and, and not necessarily even their own death, although that's part of it, but facing the death of a loved one or explaining, especially, let's say, to a young child, explaining, you know, heaven forbid if uh, a young child loses a parent, and actually I'm, I'm one of those people. I, yeah. I lost my mother when I was nine years old. Wow. Um, and so how do you counsel somebody, uh, let's, say, let's say, for example, you know, explaining to a very young child uh, who lost a young parent? Um, you know, people have a very hard time talking about death, especially when it happens. Yes, you know. yes. It, it's, um, it's very difficult to talk to children because as a parent, we want to protect those children. You know, we want to shelter them. Um, but the reality is children are very resilient. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you can speak to them um, and you can be honest with them. And then you let them absorb it. Um, some people say to me, should I bring my child to the funeral? Right. And, and my answer is, does that child, does he want to, he or she want to come to the funeral? Right. And if the answer is yes, then you should bring them. Right. Uh, we have a, um, a family room where children can stay. They mm -hmm. don't have to go into the visitation room. Uh, we have a TV in there and they can sit and watch a video. So they don't have to go into the room. But I always say to parents, if, you decide, if the child decides they want to go into the room, it's fine. This is part of life. Right. This yep. is what we all experience at some point. Um, so you don't want to put fear in them because right. this, um, this is a reality. Right. Yeah, and, th and that'll, then it'll just make them self-conscious about it. Exactly right. right. Yeah. No, I mean, exactly I think that's right. a very good approach that maybe even more important when they're young uh, is to sort of condition them that this is what happens. Yes. In life. Everybody has to go through yes. it. Yes. You know? Nobody's immune. Yes. Interestingly enough, when my, my children were young, because I was in the business, mm -hmm. they were always very used to it. Oh, yeah, right. So yeah. they, you know, I spoke about it. They heard me talk on the phone about it. So they never ever thought twice about it. Right. So, um, and, and it, 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 we don't want to bring the, the ch all children into, into, uh, into death um, and let them know about it, but there is a time when right. we have to. Right. And, and I, I think the same thing applies to uh, anybody, adults uh, certainly, who are going to a funeral and they're anxious about it, they're yes. apprehensive. and. Um, they may be thinking about what am I going to say to this person and you know sometimes somebody unintentionally will sort of blurt out something that maybe isn't appropriate you yes. know or that's yeah. awkward or embarrassing yeah. so what is your advice to people just in general about if they're going to pay respects uh, I think the best thing to say to someone is I'm sorry for the loss of your of your parents or whoever that might be just simply I'm sorry for your loss right um, people get nervous and, and right. they, you know, people say things and they're trying, they think they may be trying to be helpful, but it's a very difficult time, right. you know, for, for those who have lost someone. Yeah. So very simply and, and just, it, it's just best to say, sorry for Keep your loss. Keep it short. And Keep yeah, it short. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. And when I was going through your website, Anthony, uh, which is YorktownFuneralHome.com, yes. um, I was really struck by all of the services and resources that are available to people, uh, you know, who are uh, involved in a, in a funeral. Um, and one example is you, you were mentioning your daughter before Tracy, and she, uh, at 
somebody's request, uh, it's an option they have, will prepare a video, like a memorial video, yes. right? Um, and so how does that work? We, d we do something and we, we call it moving memories. And uh, we ask people for 100 pictures uh, that we can scan. And we ask people to put them in age order for us. Um, they can give us also uh, as many pictures as they have on a flash drive. Mm -hmm. And we create this DVD for them. And what it's about, it's about a celebration of life. It's about for those friends and family to come in and remember those good times, remember right. the parties, remember the, the, uh, yeah. the religious events that they were at. Um, it, it, it's about holding on to those memories. And uh, those are great reminders. And, and, and then they may or may not want to show that, right? Uh, as people maybe are coming into the funeral service, show it on a TV, I mean. Yeah, yeah. we play it quietly off to the side right. of the room so everybody has an opportunity to go over and view. And I stand outside sometimes and I, and I watch different groups go up to that TV and, and watch, those, yeah. watch those pictures come up and uh, talk about it or, or, or laugh about uh, something they experienced with that particular picture and, right. and, um, and remember that person who passed away in a fond way. Yeah, and, and speaking of technology, um, one of the, the more unusual developments that I wasn't totally aware of um, is that people now don't have to physically be at a funeral to, right, to yes. participate or, or at least to observe it. And, and so what is that about? Well, we, we, it's webcasting. Um, what we're able to do um, for, for those who want it, who may have family members in Europe who, want to, um, who cannot get here right. or in different parts of the country who cannot get here, they can, um, they can request a webcast of the service right. Right. And, we can, um, right. and, and we can put it out on the internet. So, that, so they can see it from a distance. So they yeah, can right. see it from a right. distance, right. yes. And one thing I want to get to, because we're getting towards the end of the program, and, and we want to make sure we talk about your um, r really special event that you ha you've been having for the last number of years, the uh, Christmas Tree Memorial Lighting Service. Yes, right? yes. The that December 5th. It'll be December 5th at, f at 5 o'clock, um, and it is a memorial tree lighting. What we do is we get a minister who comes in, and uh, it's, in, it's a ecumenical service, um, and we ask everyone who has lost someone mm -hmm. in their lives to bring an ornament. Mm -hmm. um, and after the service, we call up everyone who has passed away. Right. And that family comes up as a unit to put a, a, an ornament on a tree in remembrance of their loved one. Um, and, and it's just, it, it's a great place for everyone to be together uh, and, and at a difficult time during the holiday season. Yeah. Um, you know, it, and they're they're together with people who are all very much in that same situation right yeah so it's a it only lasts for about a half hour 35 minutes and that's is it at 5 p.m it is at 5 p.m saturday december 5th saturday right? december 5th yes and people can go to your website if uh, they need to have the location or yes one. absolutely yeah but we do ask that they uh call just to uh, let us know they'll be coming so we can anticipate the number of people that are, that are coming right we generally uh, for the last this will be our fifth year but we usually have about a hundred people or so yeah no that's quite a yeah. quite a response so it, it obviously means it's Touching people, touching yes. a lot of people. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to, I want to close because we are at the, basically the end of the program. It goes by very fast. Okay. Um, with some other quotes, as I was uh, mentioning at the, at the uh, outset of the program, um, because I think it, it helps people understand um, that death doesn't necessarily have to be, um, you know, something that is impossible to deal with. Uh, it's something that is inevitable and so the best way to approach it is, is to in each person's way try to embrace it as best that they can. Um, and so some of the other comments are, there's nothing certain in a man's life except this, that he must lose it, <laughs> which was, uh, I think it was the Greek philosopher Aeschylus, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then a couple of other ones, God made death so we'd know when to stop. <laughs> Um, and not, an anonymous one is, death is life's way of telling you you're fired. And no, that wasn't Donald Trump who said that. That was anonymous. And then the comedian Stephen Wright, I intend to live forever. So far, so good. Anyhow, I want to thank Anthony Guarino. Thank Thanks you. very much, Anthony, thank for, you being, for being our guest. 
And thank you for watching Hudson Valley WXYZ with Bruce the Blog.